Hey y'all, my name is Morgan, Morgan on the Violin, and I am here to give you a review of the E-Star EVA2, and especially tell you why not to buy this instrument. So I'm going to break this video down into three parts. Uh, for those of y'all who are in a hurry, I'm going to go ahead and give you the quick skinny on why you shouldn't buy this instrument and where you should look instead. And then I'm going to go in depth about the problems with this instrument. If you're looking to get a little more informed about these instruments as you're shopping for them, that'll be good to watch. So let's dive in. All right. So why not buy this? Um, I say instrument. I really shouldn't be calling an instrument. It's more like a toy. Uh, it costs $110 on Amazon. That might seem really tempting, but it's really, really not worth your money. Uh, it's going to end up hurting you or your child and their ability to learn for a number of different reasons. One is that it sounds really poor. Even when somebody who knows what they're doing is playing, it sounds really poor in the quality. And that means that when you or your child are learning how to play, it's going to be harder for them to tell whether or not they're actually improving on the instrument. Because the instrument's going to sound better whether they're doing it right or they're doing it wrong. And that's not a good thing, right? That's going to slow you down, slow them down. And so it's going to make it a lot less enjoyable to actually learn the instrument. It's not going to be as inspiring to learn the instrument. Another big issue with this instrument is that it's actually legit painful to play. So my hands are already kind of conditioned for the violin because I play the violin. And playing on this instrument still hurts, especially as I start to move up in position because the strings are really stiff and they're not very forgiving. The action is really high and the instrument is just very poorly made. And so it just is not a pleasant instrument to play on. That goes for the left hand as well as the right hand. The bow that comes with this instrument is very poorly finished. And so it's going to also cause pain in the thumb, especially for you or your child as they're playing this instrument. So what you should not do is you should not buy this instrument. You'll be a lot better off if you spend a little more money and get a little bit something more something that's actually a violin. This is what we would typically call a violin shaped object. Uh, where should you shop instead? So there are some links below in the description. One I recommend is sharmusic.com. They're good. They're beginner instruments. I use them with my students and I have one myself. It works well. Another option if you have to buy off of uh, Amazon is to go with the Bundles. Bundle Pupil is a respectable instrument for a beginner student. It will meet their needs. Another option is uh, fiddlershop.com. I don't have any experience with their instruments, but I got a good feeling that you won't have misspent your money if you buy from them as well. All in all though, the one rule you really should keep in mind when buying a beginner instrument is do not spend less than $200 on a new beginner instrument. Do not. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get a violin shaped object. You're going to get something that's going to impair the ability of you or your child to actually learn this instrument and enjoy it. So this concludes the quick summary of the video. If you got a lot out of it, please go ahead and hit like and subscribe so that I know to keep making videos like this and so that others know that this video is a video worth watching. Thank you. So we're going to break down now different aspects of the instrument that make it so bad and talk about why that they're a problem, what makes them bad. Uh, that's going to include the strings, the fingerboard here, the bridge, the sound post. Um, I'll briefly touch on a few other things as well that are just other areas where the quality is pulled back and that impacts the sound and the playability. Uh, oh, and these little dots right here too. We're going to look at that real quick. So let's talk about the strings first. Uh, the strings impact both the sound quality instrument as well as uh, that aspect of it where I talked about it being painful to play earlier. Well, that's this in part the strings doing. These are really cheap strings. They're cheap in fact. For that on a $110 product, they give you two sets of strings. Uh, normally on a violin outfit, you get strings that are themselves at least worth $10 for a whole set which is still really, really cheap. More typically $20, $30, which is still on the cheap end for strings, but not like abysmally cheap. These are like strings that are maybe $5 at most. I wouldn't surprise me if they were even worth that much, to be honest. So really cheap strings contribute to both the strings being harder to work with because they are less easy to press down, as well as strings that are not going to sound as good when you're playing the instrument. Let's move to another big playability factor. Um, that is going to be the fingerboard right here. Now, a proper fingerboard 
is going to have a couple of things. One, it's not going to have these dots in it. Two, it's going to have a little curvature running down the fingerboard this way. Uh, this instrument does not have that. It is completely straight. It's also going to have some special uh, conditioning done to the rest other parts of the fingerboard to help make it play in tune reliably. When you put your finger down, you get the right note that you're looking for kind of thing, as well as make it easier to play, as well as improve the sound quality because, you know, start to move up the string, fingerboard, the string will slap the fingerboard if, it's, uh, if they're too close together. This fingerboard has none of the qualities that it's looking for. Uh, it doesn't even feel like a normal violin fingerboard because of the paint that they put on it. Normal violin fingerboards are made of ebony, and they have, they're have they completely unfinished. They're just polished. That's it. Whereas this has been painted in a material that honestly kind of feels like plastic. So this is a really low-quality fingerboard. It's not shaped the way you need it to be. And once a student starts to move into third position or any higher than that, which they will do if they're making good progress within anywhere from a year to two years of starting the instrument, they're going to be out of tune because of this fingerboard, and they're going to learn uh, improper placement of the fingers, if nothing else, in order to play in tune on this instrument. And then when they go play a properly set up instrument, they're going to have to kind of relearn where to put their fingers. So um, that's going to be a problem. It's going to hold them back. Alrighty, so that's the fingerboard. And last thing I'll say, these little dots are in the wrong place. You can see from the picture here that the little dots are a little bit flat from where they're supposed to be. So if you're thinking you can get away with learning this instrument using these dots, no. Because that's going to teach you or your child how to play flat, out of tune. And then again, it's just not going to sound good when you actually go to like play music. So better thing to do is to get a regular violin, uh, an actual violin for, you know, $200, $250 if you have to be super budget. And then get, you know, a professional teacher or violin person to put some tape on the fingerboard for you in the right places and it'll be in tune and your fingerboard will be a little bit better shape and your strings will be a little bit more easy and enjoyable to play. All right, so that's all of that. Um, these are factors that really affect the playability of the instrument from uh, both ease of use and intonation standpoint. Let's continue on a little bit on the sound quality side of things. With that, we've got the bridge and the sound post. So uh, the bridge you might call the heart of the violin. Uh, maybe not the best word, it's kind of hard to say. But the sound post of the violin absolutely is actually called the soul of the violin in some languages. It is that important to the sound quality of the instrument. And how are these two objects doing on this instrument? Well, to give you an idea of how cheap this bridge is, they give you two of them. Hey, look at that, you get two bridges for the price of one. That's not a good thing, that's a bad thing. So this bridge is basically completely unprepared for this particular violin, literally the one I'm holding in my hands right now. Properly done, each bridge has to be tailor cut just a little bit to each violin, sometimes a lot, especially around the feet. The feet is a, are a really, really important part. You can see from the photos of this instrument that the feet do not contact fully with the top plate of the violin. And that's going to cause a lot of loss of transmission of vibrations and sound through the bridge, from the string through the bridge into the top plate, into the, the resonance chamber of the violin, right? Um, so that's that's really, really bad. This just it hasn't been tailor cut to this instrument. The instruments that are, you know, at least $200 and more, they've actually made some effort to tailor cut these so that they fit pretty flush, usually perfectly flush with the top plate of that particular instrument. Um, each bridge has to be cut to each top plate because each top plate is going to be a little bit different. Um, you can see the image here of my professional violin with the professionally cut bridge completely solidly in contact with the top plate of the instrument. Um, so just for comparison. Another issue going on with the bridge is they have not made any effort to shave it down. Uh, you, this bridge is around two and a half millimeters thick at the top. That's going to do a lot to dampen the sound of the violin and uh, reduce the amount of the quality of the sound that's actually making it into the into the into the resonance chamber of the instrument. You can see again another comparison photo the top part of the bridge on my professionally carved violin uh, bridge is 
around about 1.1 millimeters, and that's about appropriate for a full-size violin when it's professionally done. They take out extra mass in the bridge too, and that also allows the bridge to vibrate more and translate more of the actual sound, the energy of the strings vibrating into the resonance chamber. And then the last little thing uh, is the little holes here in the bridge. These would normally be carved out a little more to again, I'll allow the bridge to open up a little bit more, breathe a little more, and translate more of the sound into the instrument. Now, on those $200 to $250 instruments, and even like on a $400, $500 beginner violin, you wouldn't expect to see that level of detail paid attention to within those bridges either. They usually are thinned up more, usually down to somewhere in the one and a half millimeter range to two millimeter range. That's better than two and a half millimeters. They put some effort into it, but it's not gonna necessarily be professionally done because that requires a lot of extra skill and labor hours, and they're still trying to mass produce instruments. Uh, they also won't do anything really to carve out these holes either, because that's also a little bit of you know skill, labor hours, some artistry that goes into that. So these are things that we won't see a big difference necessarily, between this cheap $110 instruments bridge or two bridges and the other lower end instruments that are, you know, $200, $250, $300, even $500, but there'll still be a significant improvement over this. Just having the feet fully in contact with the pop plate alone is a great thing. All right, so that's enough about the bridge. It's a lot about the bridge, actually. Um, let's talk about the sound post. So if you look in the photo here, you see the sound post in this particular instrument is set dead underneath the bridge. That is extremely bad. That puts a lot of pressure right on top of the sound post in a way that's basically going to pinch off the sound of the instrument. It's another piece of why this instrument ends up being really muffled and doesn't have any ability to resonate uh, and sound out the way we want it to. Uh, where should a sound post actually be? So in those, you know, nor worth using beginner instruments. The sound post is generally placed about five millimeters behind the bridge. That's the um, the traditional place to put the sound post. That said, on my professional violin, it's like seven millimeters behind the sound post because the guy who made it knew what he was doing and he knew that that's where he wanted his sound post to be. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but for beginner instruments, it definitely should be sitting about five millimeters behind the center of the bridge if it's placed properly. And it is not in this instrument, and I would not expect it to be placed properly in other versions of this instrument or other instruments below $200. Because, again, it's a level of care and detail that these folks are just, they're not worried about uh, because of the money. So what are some other factors here that are going to affect this instrument? Oh, um, sorry, going back to the bridge. One last thing. You have to put this bridge up yourself. And since you have to put this bridge up yourself, you're probably going to put it in the wrong place. And that's also going to mess with the sound quality. But, you know, why not? What's the matter at this point, right? Otherwise, you know, the wood is cheap. The varnish is cheap. It looks kind of ugly. And it, it looks like a toy. It looks like literally it's the idea of a violin rather than actually being a violin. Um, I will say on this instrument, the pegs actually stick in the peg box. It's one thing that they have gotten right here. The Cremona SV75s that I see occasionally from my students, they have terrible issues with the pegs actually sticking in the peg box. Again, if you spend at least $200 on a new beginner instrument, you're going to get pegs that are going to stick properly in the peg box. You know, winter time, dry weather, weather changes, they might pop loose. That's normal season changes. But, you know, once it's all adjusted again, it's going to sit there and stay there the way we want it to. It stays in tune. Uh, this violin actually does that. Yay. Others of the below $200 range will not always do that. Alrighty. So, one last thing. I've talked a lot about the instrument. Let's talk a little bit about the bow and look at that. I mentioned earlier in the video, too, that the bow is also painful to play on. And in this case, the reason for that, the quality, if you look at the images here, the quality of the little rest rubber piece that you set your thumb, uh, index finger on, it's very thin. And there's no real cushion to it whatsoever, so that's not going to feel good under your fingers. It's a little abrasive too compared to what you would get in uh, a slightly nicer, a little better finish bow, which you will get in those other outfits. But too, the big thing is the frog, this part where our thumb sits. You see on the higher quality bow, 
it is actually finished well. It's smooth, it's soft, uh, it's gentle on the skin of the thumb. It's not gonna be abrasive. Whereas on this cheap bow from this $110 outfit, they've not bothered to finish or really polish that enough. And so it's actually ends up being a little bit abrasive. And because of the angle they cut into it, it also wants to kind of dig into that also digs into the thumb some. And so a student playing with this bow for 15, 30 minutes a day is going to start to have pain and even potentially a blister on their thumb from this bow. And that's that's again, that's not ideal. It's not what we want. We don't want this instrument to hurt when we play it. It's already hard enough as it is. We don't need to add pain to the mix. So spend a little more money and you won't have to deal with pain. Um, you'll have uh, a good instrument that's actually useful uh, with a bow that's actually you know reasonably enjoyable to play. Alrighty, there you go. That is everything you know need to know about the E-Star EVA2 and why you should not buy it and all the various problems it has and they're going to be faced with. Again, there are links to more reputable retailers below. And again, I can't stress enough, do not spend less than $200 on your beginner violin outfit, especially if you're buying new. Thank you for watching my video. Hope you found this very helpful, the information useful, and in guiding you in your process of stepping into the wide world of uh, beginner violins and purchasing these instruments. If you got a lot of value out of this, please go ahead and hit like and subscribe so that I know to keep making these videos and other folks know that this is a video worth watching. Thank you.